I can't hear you. Are you muted? No, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yes. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I wish it were an actual person. <laughs> you too. In so me many too. ways. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for what you guys are going well, through there. Well, we're, well, we're all going through. It's yeah, we are all going through it. It's a very moment in every way. Um, first of all. Alrighty, everyone, we're live. Have fun. Okay, oh, great. <laughs> Hi, we're live. Good morning, everyone. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Rothy. I'm the director of New Works at Kansas City Repertory Theater, and I am speaking to you live from the heartland in Kansas City, Missouri, not Kansas. And I'm virtually, <laughs> and virtually joining us is artistic director Stuart Carden, who just started this job last August, and the illustrious Todd London. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Um, I, um, I'm going to give a brief bio for Todd in a few minutes, but I just first just want to say that um, we're so grateful that everyone could join us this morning. Um, uh, Stuart just joined us two seconds ago, so he's not quite sure of what we're doing, but I'm just going <laughs> to. I just want to thank a few people. I'm going to thank our sponsors to say that KC uh, presents this program in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I also want to thank everyone at HowlRound who's helped us put this live streaming event together. Um, HowlRound TV is a free and shared resource for live conversations and performances relevant to the world's performing arts and cultural fields. And its mission is to break geographic isolation I promote resource sharing and to develop our knowledge commons collectively. So Stuart, if you would like to kick us off with a few words. I, I would, absolutely. I'm so grateful that, uh, Lisa, that, that you were able to pull this together. Um, we're living in an extraordinary moment. And um, uh, this was a part, this conversation with Todd was going to be uh, in, person and we were going to stream it, uh, but we were going to have Todd at Kansas City and a Kansas City rep with us. Um, and uh, as uh, everyone has experienced this week, um, we've had we've had to adapt and change. And um, so we had the extraordinary opportunity to launch uh, one world premiere last night to a private audience. Um, uh, and we lifted Frankenstein, a ghost story, uh, into the air for opening and closing simultaneously. Um, but we were very happy to be able to, to share that piece with, with uh, a private audience that were deeply moved by the experience. And then we're gonna do the same thing tonight with our other world premiere by Stacy Rose, uh, Legacy Land, an extraordinary piece of writing and an extraordinary production. Um, and so we'll do a private opening tonight and it will also be uh, the opening and closing of that production. But you know, uh, a lot of our colleagues around the country have not been able to thread this window to even get to this moment. So we're grateful that, uh, that at least we get to um, uh, see the piece through the emotional conclusion of an opening. Um, so that's just a little context of where we are at KC Rep and the context of, of uh, this, um, opportunity to engage with Todd. Uh, and uh, Lisa has done a terrific job of switching things around to be able to, to make this possible, uh, even though we're um, geographically remote. Um, so I'm thrilled uh, that I get to meet you <laughs> in this way, Todd. <laughs> and I'm really grateful that you're, you um, still uh, um, were game to share some thoughts and ideas and perspective on new plays uh, in America at this moment. So I'm going to turn so back much. over. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to turn things back over to Lisa. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let Todd talk a little bit about the plays because that was also part of his oh, great. Um, keynote. So we'll do that, but I'm, and so I'm not going to say anything about that at the moment, but I also, I just want to acknowledge that this would have been the fifth new play festival, which was started in 2016 with former artistic director, Eric Rosen, and, and the former director of new works, Marissa Wolf. So I wanted to thank them for championing new work and developing the blueprint for the festival. Um, and so I'm, again, I'm too grateful. Thanks Todd for joining us and for doing this so quickly. I mean, we just canceled everybody's flights. So thanks for organizing your space in Brooklyn with that beautiful <laughs> painting. I love that. Um, 
so we're <laughs> who is it by it's by joan snyder who's this amazing painter who took a playwriting class with my wife karen hartman and mm. gave her a print as a thank you for her help as a writer it's a great backdrop yeah i'm i'm an artist housing so i tried to do my best with some flowers sure <laughs> and Stuart, you have your, and Stuart, you've got a whiteboard with you with I do. your children's names. I do. <laughs> and so welcome uh, when you first uh, came into my office and, um, and it stayed up since. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So I, I'm just going to do a little bit of a bio for Todd and then we're going to let Todd run with it. Um, so I know many of you who are tuning in uh, who know Todd and are aware of his accomplishments, but since we're virtual and we can't see any of our audience and we're not quite sure who you are, I'm just going to give you a brief bio. So Todd spent 18 years as artistic director of New York's New Dramatists, the nation's oldest laboratory theater for playwrights, and under his leadership the company received a, a special Tony honor and an Obie award and the first recipient of Theater Communications Group's Visionary Leadership Award for advancing the theater field as a whole. He also won the George Jean Mason Award for Dramatic Criticism. Todd received an honorary doctorate from DePaul University in 2016. Uh, a former executive director of the University of Washington in School of Drama, Todd is director of theater relations for, relations for the Dramatists Guild, head of MFA playwriting at the New School, and founding director of the Third Bohemia, an interdisciplinary retreat for artists. Um, Todd has written many books, including An Ideal Theater, Founding Visions for a New American Art, Outrageous Fortune, The Life and Times of the New American Play, The Importance of Staying Earnest, 15 Actors, 20 Years, The Artistic Home, his first novel, The World's Room, and his second novel, If You See Him, Let Me Know, just came out last month. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit later. And This Is Not My Memoir, co-authored with Andre Gregory, is due out in May. So friends and colleagues, I give you Todd London. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, all of you who are here, wherever you are. I'm coming to you from my dining room table in Brooklyn, New York, as Lisa said. I don't know where you are, but I am really glad we're together, if only through the magic of the virtual. I had hoped to be with many of you in Kansas City at the Kansas City Repertory Theater this weekend to help launch the fifth annual Origin KC New Works Festival, but as so much else, it wasn't meant to be. Um, I want to echo what Stuart said. I know there are theater artists all over the country sitting at home when you were supposed to be in rehearsal or on stage or celebrating this opening or that final week. I know that there are years of work that are on hold or postponed or canceled, and we all suffer for it as we suffer for the lack of witness to that work. We are such natural gatherers in the theater, always making that essential invitation of the art, the request I've come to think of simply as, let me sit with you a while. So I'm grateful to all of you who, as a plan B or C or X, Y, Z, will sit with me a while this morning. <laughs> Thank you for your Saturday. Um, just a few words about now. I mean, risk is the realm of the theater, but it's not such a good strategy when it comes to global pandemics. Risk is our realm and crisis is our norm and improvisation is at the top of the list of skills required for a life in this art. So our good friends at the Rep, New Works Director Lisa Rothi, who you just met, the new Artistic Director, congratulations, Stuart Carden, and the whole team, as well as the brilliant original Commons Connector streamers at HowlRound, with the unbreakable calm of risk-taking, improvisational crisis surfers, have scrambled to gather us together right here, wherever that is, enabling us to keep our social distance while bridging it. There's such an achiness to this moment. I keep thinking of Laura Eason's festival play, The Vast In-Between. In it, a woman in the middle of an eroding marriage travels weekly between Chicago and Seattle, but really lives in the spaces between. She's neither with her daughter, a cusp teenager at 13, or truly separate from her. She's obsessed with a neighbor who's recently caught, been caught leading a bigamous life and she flirts with such a life herself, stepping in and pulling out on 
each trip away from home. She can remember the good beginnings of her marriage and already knows what the ending might be. Still, everywhere she moves is the in-between where it's never clear just how to live where you are. That really feels like now to me, in between as far as the eye can see as we trudge on through our collective limbo. So this was meant to be a keynote speech, 45 minutes long, but now it's more like a fireside chat with the fire being an office candle. The subject of the chat was the subject of the festival itself, plays and origins and what's new and especially the work of new works. If you're listening now, I suspect it's because you are part of that work, whether you are a playwright, director, actor, designer, festival thrower, dramaturgical advisor, administrator, spectator, auditor, supporter, helper, or hanger around her. Whatever your role is, you're part of this labor of newness. And I'm excited to think about it with you, to put words into what that labor is and why it's important. I wanna start by simply saying the names of the plays and the playwrights who were to have been part of the festival in hopes that you'll seek them out in some other way. As Stuart mentioned, a production of Kyle Hatley's two-person adaptation of Marie Shelley's Frankenstein kicked off the festival to be last night, directed by Joni Schultz, followed by a reading of Mashuk Mashtak Dean's Flood, directed by Ken Prestoninzi. The second full production, which will have its opening and closing tonight, we heard, was of Stacy Rose's Legacy Land with Logan Vaughn as director. And finally, a reading of The Vast in Between, Laura Eason's play with Joni Schultz again as director. There were wonderful panels planned with some great compassionate dramaturgical minds, the best in our profession, and of course, barbecue. Apparently the staff of the rep spent some time yesterday reflecting on the wonderful weekend that wasn't as if remembering it after the fact, each one describing favorite moments and meals. I love theater people. <laughs> if we can't live it, we dream it. If the space is empty, we fill it up one way or another. I've only been to Kansas City and the rep once though I feel as if I know it because I've known three of the former artistic directors. George Keithley, Peter Altman, and Eric Rosen. I've known them for decades. Lisa Rothi, who put this festival together, has happily been in my life for a long time, as has Marissa Wolf, who was the founder or a founder of Origin KC Festival. I was eager this, meet, this weekend to meet Stuart, the new artistic director, and to be there in person to wish him great things in the years ahead. I say all this not to brag on my connections or establish rep credentials, but to point out an obvious fact. Even in the land of the new, new plays, new artistic director, new decade, we're always building on what's come before, changing it, reacting to it, updating it or leaping off from it. Whether we tear down the structures in which we find ourselves or merely remodel the parts of the house we think time-worn, whether we ignore or pay tribute, modify or dismantle, evolve or revolt, we in the theater are always part of some kind of continuous creation. The setting of Stacy Rose's legacy land is also its centerpiece, a house haunted and defined by brutality and love as though the building itself remembers its incestuous history, a past that tears two sisters apart even as it binds them together. Stacy's title is the perfect name for the place we live when we are new. We usher in the new while standing in legacy land. This is true of theaters and it's true of playmakers. I often return to John Guare's ravishing introduction to a 1997 collection of Thornton Wilder's short plays. Guare imagines a, playwright, a parade of playwrights from Aeschylus on down to anyone who's even written one play. Each generation says, quote, finish my work, finish what I've started. These are the questions I leave behind. And so we proceed to make the new from unanswered questions bequeathed to us until the time comes when we leave our own questions for those who come after us to answer. Our questions may be old, but our preoccupation with them is of the moment. 
One era may ask, what is liberation? How do I get free? Another might be driven to know what we owe to each other, the extent of our li or limit of our social responsibility. We might be compelled to see the source of human inhumanity or wonder how to forgive evil, which isn't to say that a single question defines a time, but that questions circulate through history, gaining urgency with the events of the day. It's not new, for example, for artists to probe questions of identity, racial, ethnic, or sexual, for example. The theater has always done so. But sometimes the questions flame hotter as they do today. Sometimes the questions require newer answers to suit evolving conditions and norms. Enduring questions are our provocations. And as the activist intellectual Cornell West has written, quote, just as hope just as hope is the fruit of love, provocation is the fruit of vocation and invocation. In other words, our questions arise from the work we're called to do and from our prayers, our conjuring calls for help and guidance from others, including whatever gods we worship. Work and prayer, both callings, bring forth our questions, our provocations. Cornell West offers a great example of how a single line of inquiry can lead to a whole lineage of artists. In his celebratory introduction to A Moment on the Clock of the World, the anthology of essays that culminated the 25 year lifespan of the important Foundry Theater in New York, West singles out a terrifying question from a char the character of Mama in Lorraine Hansberry's Raisin in the Sun. Quote, how does one bequeath to the younger generation the rich traditions of critique and resistance. From this question, posed by a character full of mature love, unparalleled on our stages, West traces an aesthetic very different from that of playwrights focused, for example, on the, un the bleak underbelly of America. He calls this aesthetic line a great caravan of love, of truth, beauty, goodness, and sometimes of God, that provokes us into a habitual vision of excellence and elegance, joy and justice, courage and contestation. In this lineage, he places the work of musicians, John Coltrane and Nina Simone, and of novelists, Toni Morrison and James Baldwin. To that line, I'd add playwrights Lynn Nottage, Terrell Alvin McCraney, Jackie Sibley's Drury, Daniel Alexander Jones, Alicia Harris, as well as many others who don't share an African-American heritage, but work in this tradition of love and justice, like Taylor Mack, Haruna Lee, Tony Kushner, Kiara Alegria Hoodies, Larissa Fast Horse, Universes, and the beat goes on. Our ongoing questions make the world go round and where they stop is new. Let's set newness aside for a second and look at another choice of words. I love that the folks at the Rep chose to call this a festival of new works as opposed to new plays. I suspect there are a lot of reasons for this diction. The theater is absolutely a place for plays, but it's also a place for many other kinds of creation, spectacles, performances, rituals, participatory events or immersive ones, and what we call those things we don't know what to call, theater pieces. The more we proliferate and change, the newer the new gets, the more it spills out of old linguistic containers, the shared codes that help us know what to expect from the art meal prepared for us. So yes, let's just call it work, new work. And let's go back to the words, the roots, even of the word playwright, the right of which first referred to a woodworker, builder, constructionist. Think about woodworking when you think about playmaking, the heft of the lumber, the muscular intensity of the cut, we saw and hammer, fit and bang. And then when we've acquired the skill and finesse, we, or you, because I'm not a playwright nor a carpenter, we scrape and sand and lathe and turn, the lumber of our love. Funny how these ancient crafts shape our linguistic legacy. There's a woodworking term known as scribing, which describes the way a molding or frame gets shaped to fit the piece abutting it and how the lines or patterns get engraved when a replacement piece goes in, a carving made to match. And with some splendid comet cosmic precision, another word for scribing is coping, 
We write to cope, and in writing, we must learn to cope with so very much. All to say, when we come together to W-R-I-G-H-T new work, we are coming together to build something separately or together, each in their own role or roles. And that something, though built out of just created synthetics or old unanswered questions, first thoughts or naive discoveries, that's something we call new. It's never new from scratch, even though for the creator, it may be a belly crawl through the dark into the unknown. Kyle Hatley's Frankenstein is a play or performance piece or a play with music played by a lone woman museum, uh, musician whose appearances and disappearances are part of the thematic and sonic landscape of loss at the heart of the work. In the story, which mostly follows the novel, but in a contemporary key, Victor Frankenstein makes something never made before. Frankenstein's monster is new, but he's made out of old parts, dead parts, sewn together in a motley of muscle and bone, flesh and feature. Yes, we all know the new can be monstrous. Just maybe, to hammer the Frankenstein metaphor home, What's new about a theater creation isn't its parts, which are repurposed and borrowed and dug up from the ruins of previous lives. What's new is the animating jolt, the enlivening spirit discovered only after years of trial and error, long nights in the laboratory, and the kind of burst of insight born of intense labor. The life spark is what's new. It's also what's distinct, the part that can't be replicated the spirit or soul something that makes one person unique and utterly oneself. In theater, we call this distinction voice. I spent 18 years as artistic director of New Dramatists in New York, where playwrights enjoy seven year residencies. I had a quotation on my door that I understood in a limited way. It's from the novelist D.H. Lawrence who proclaimed, it's hard to hear a new voice, as hard as to listen to an unknown language. Why? Out of fear. The, fear. the world fears new experience more than it fears anything. It can pigeonhole any idea, but it can't pigeonhole a real new experience. It can only dodge. The world is a great dodger and the Americans the greatest because they dodge their very own selves. Can we agree that the fear of the new, of the unknown, fear of the languages of others is on bold display in our country these days. Can we agree that although we, the so-called people, seem not to agree on a damn thing, that we as a people on the right or left or anywhere in between live in a federation of segregated echo chambers soothed by familiarity and the recognizable? If this is what D.H. Lawrence means by Americans being dodgers of the new, then he had us pegged. Which is not to say that we don't sometimes need echo chambers. I mean, choirs need preaching to, to keep them singing. We need to hear our shared beliefs reiterated and keep the fires of faith and inspiration and activism stoked. But artistic echo chambers are bad for the evolution of the art form itself. If audiences want the familiar, if they come to depend on certain guideposts for the good, a certain kind of character at the center, a certain kind of violent conflict that feels dramatic, a certain kind of humor that grows from a certain kind of recognizable type, a certain kind of story about a newsworthy topic or subject of agreed upon importance. All this agreement on what makes quality theater actually contributes to its decline. In this context, too much new can be weird or even scary. We value what reminds us of things we've previously valued, but we learn from that which causes confusion, the confusion that precedes learning, the categorical frustration that precedes new stages of human growth. A hundred years later, we still don't know what to call the place of Chekhov, tragedy or comedy or tragic comedy or what. After Beckett and the post-war post-nuclear playwrights constellating around him, critics had to construct a whole new category of absurdism because those slippery playwrights frustrated all the existing and existential categories. What kind of box does Adrian Kennedy belong in? Or Maria Irene Fornes? 
no box. That's exactly the point. They were absolutely new 50 years ago and continue to be new now. Their absence from major stages stands in shocking contradiction to their continuing ups and down. Up, I'm sorry, their shocking, their absence from major stages stands in shocking contradiction to their continuing and up to this very minute influence. Remember John Guare's Playwrights Parade and Cornell West's Car Caravan of Love? I'd be hard pressed to think of American playwrights leading longer parades or caravans these days than Adrian Kennedy or Irene Fornes, other than maybe the sneakily influential Thornton Wilder, despite their remaining virtually unknown to the theater going public. Maybe, that's, maybe what's new is that which stays new that which concatenates more of the same, which is newly different. That's why I love festivals like this one, like our festival to be, even if we have to engage it virtually and imagine it privately. Here we are around our computers, kept at a distance by disease, together envisioning a new newness. Bring it on. But I've been winding my way to another point, and that's this. New voices aren't always new. I'm gonna say that again. New voices aren't always new. They may just be new to us, to the people who live where we live and look like we look. They may be new to a theater of one size or another. They may have been making their beautiful sounds mostly unheard through stretches of semi-solitary artistic gestation, which could last decades in a field that often favors the young and new over the long laboring 20 year overnight sensations. The doors that lead truly new artists to audiences to us may have been previously closed. They may just be new to us because we're part of a cu culture not used to listening to the voices of another culture in forms those voices take out of the traditions from which those voices rise. I've had this experience a lot and maybe you have too. It's the time of year they announce the Nobel Prize for Literature. And suddenly I stumble upon a new Chinese novelist or Egyptian poet or Russian journalist. And despite the fact that they are major mature international geniuses with massive bodies of historic work, I've just made a discovery. I'm suddenly in touch with the new. I had a high school teacher who at such a moment would have tossed a chalkboard eraser my way and called me an ethnocentric booby. And he would be right. There aren't enough erasers in America to hit all us ethnocentric boobies in the theater. Citizens cannot relate well to the complex world around them by factual knowledge and logic alone. The ethical philosopher Martha Nussbaum argues in Not For Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. The third ability of the citizen, she continues, after knowledge and after knowledge gathering and logic, quote, is what we call narrative imagination. Without the arts to foster this narrative imagination that allows us to walk in the shoes of others, and I quote, we do not automatically see another human being as spacious and deep, having thoughts, spiritual longings and emotions. It is all too easy to see another person just as a body, which we might then think we can use for our ends, good or bad. The arts and humanities allow us to quote, see a soul in that body. But how can you see a soul in an unfamiliar body with blinders on? In the predominantly white American theater, the sound of our dominant culture is so loud the gaze of its audience is so defining that even young masters like last year's Pulitzer Prize winner, Jackie Sibley's Drury and Obie winner, Alicia Harris are experimenting with strategies to segregate African-American audiences from the way more numerous white ones, just to have a chance to speak directly to and heal with the people they write their plays for without explanation or apology. In a 2018 speech turned essay called High Tide of Heartbreak, Tony and Pulitzer winner Chiara Alegria Hudis writes, it is discombobulating and even humiliating to write Latinx characters who will be seen mostly by white audiences, 
it feels like either their brownness or their humanity is the primary performance. The point is this, in a theater that has been mostly produced by and presented to a homogenous cultural vantage point, the new is often a product of difference. The other can seem very new, even when they've been here all along, invisible to those of us who prevail. The work of the new in this sense is the work of our nation, that of speaking across origin and difference, race and culture and gender, ability and age, to listen across divergent and even incompatible histories. And it's this work that makes what we do when we gather together in a theater, especially when we gather to listen to and for the previously unspoken or unheard, it's this work that makes it so urgent. This urgency electrifies the waters of Dean's flood. The play is a stirring absurdist cri de corps about those who refuse to see even the most evident dire changes happening around them. A man fiddles endlessly with a tabletop model he's building out of wood while his wife, while his wife stands by to brew tea for the day he's finished with his masterpiece, that future quiet time when they can be together and answer the unanswerable questions about life she's been keeping on a list. Meanwhile, the ocean is rising all around them, threatening to reach even their apartment on the 16th floor. Meanwhile, their two children, both unlike their parents, ethnically and in gender expression, living lower down are drowning. The man fiddles, the woman waits, and even their children's calls can't rouse them from insensibility and denial. They don't know who their children are and they don't hear their alarms. Will the playwright's call rouse us? It's easy to say that theater teaches empathy. Maybe, maybe empathy is fostered in the act of making theater. I like to believe it is. But if over the past 50 years, theater going has upped the capacity for empathy in our audiences, why has it been so hard for our traditional patrons to accept the work of writers who don't share their heritage? Why aren't our subscribers clamoring for more plays by Black, Latinx, Asian, and Native American artists, for LGBTQ artists, for artists from different nations with different abilities? Why aren't they picketing our institutions? Stop with the Shakespeare already. Down with Ibsen and his heirs. We've had enough of Aristotle. I had a teacher in graduate school, a distinguished literary critic who didn't throw erasers, but instead lobbed questions at us. One simple one stays with me. Would you rather read a writer who describes experience similar to your own, recognizable and what we now call relatable, or a writer who describes worlds very different from your own? I confess that to my shame, I picked door number one. I wanted the recognizable, the familiar, that which confirmed the world as I knew it, rather than that which would make me work to break through what I knew, to acknowledge the alien, and I don't mean the alien in the sci-fi sense. I didn't speak my answer out loud at the time, but I knew the self-incriminating truth, and I knew I had to do whatever it took to turn my attention to the merely familiar around. That distinguished, and I now see wise professor, made the case for the other door, the one that opens to the other, the unknown, the world we might never have stepped foot in, populated by people we might never have met. She was making the case, not exactly for the new, but for the new to each of us, the different from each of us, work on which I now absolutely believe our lives, our humanity, our civilization depends. What then, if this is the work of our lives and civilization, is possible in the theater? Here's what I'd suggest. The ongoing labor of making work for the stage has two essential features, that of individual creative fulfillment and that of social cooperation. In the land of playwrights, the world of new and mature voices, we can clearly see this first feature, how imaginative and emotional freedom leads to individual distinction. There is little in this life more exciting and inspiring than an artistic voice finding its fullness. In my years at New Dramatists, I got to know writers and their bodies of work really well. 
I can see the project of that work, the ways it intersects with their lives, the way one play leads to another, to another, questions raised at the end of one becoming the springboard for the next. I think of this as the beautiful flourishing of distinct beings. And I first learned it from living in community with playwrights and by writing about their bodies of work in the spirit of admiration and celebration, including right here on HowlRound. Isn't this why we're here in this treacherous, terrifying and magnificent world to make the most of the gifts we've got for the time we've got? And as when you scan the walls of a museum or walk the paths of a botanic garden in full flower, you see how profoundly unique each vision is when it appears in relief to another or stands out in a field of wild biodiversity. You learn what makes a thing, a voice, a person, a talent distinct is how its singular brilliance shines next to the singular brilliance of others. I saw a shockingly original production this month, the remounting of Haruna Lee's Suicide Forest at Maie Theater in New York City, now sadly closed as so much vibrant, hard-won, beautiful theater is, even in the past 48 hours. I don't have time or wit to describe it all as this piece flips from Japanese to English, from inspired frenzy to profoundly intimate self-revelation and places in between. The writer, Haruna Lee plays the central character too, a teenage girl trapped in the over-sexualized rape culture of the male workplace, part cartoon and all nightmare. She also plays a version of herself and presents herself to us in a kind of naked vulnerable revelation only possible in the live theater. The writer's own Japanese mother in the piece, she appears in the piece, her mom, is in the piece, making her Butoh-like way through an abstract forest, whereas the mythic Mad Mad, she lures lovers to their deaths. Haruna Lee's piece takes place in two languages, leaping cultures, traditions, myths, and genres, but it really takes place in the artist's heart and mind and soul from which it is gifted to us, utterly new. Shortly after, I saw another autobiographically inspired work centering on a playwright's mother, the tour de force of Lucas Nath's Dana H, crafted from verbatim interviews with the playwright's mother 20 years after her five month kidnapping at the hands of a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. And I saw still another uncategorizable event also steeped in autobiography, Jillian Walker's lush and musically interwoven unpacking of race and color, family history and self, skin folk. Each work as distinct as it could be, each voice unmistakable. Meanwhile, preparing for Kansas City for today, I read Kyle Hatley and Stacy Rose and Laura Eason and Mashuk Dean. In all this singularity, all this difference of voice and project and self, this I found and this again I came to know. When it comes to playwrights, a rose is a rose is a rose, and so it is for Hatley and Eason and Dean. All this brings me to the second part of the work of the new. In addition to fostering the singular gifts of the individual artist, in this instance, the play carpenter, the theater demands social cooperation to an almost unparalleled degree. I've been compulsively quoting director, author, ensemble genius, Anne Bogart's statement that, quote, theater is the only art form that is always about social systems. Every play asks, can we get along? Can we get along as a society? Can we get along in this room? How might we get along better? Every play, according to Anne, asks us to imagine a society and every process of building a play asks it. It's part of what makes theater so difficult and awe-inspiring. You have the playwrights in their solitary creative lairs, ruthlessly plumbing their lives and the lives of others, imagining to the farthest limits of personal ability, exercising a relentless radical freedom to be whoever they are, think whatever they think and say whatever they must the solitary playwrights peeling the layers of self in the privacy of their process, and then 
with a crazy raw vulnerability falling somewhere between egotistic hubris at one end and codependent desperation at the other, they deliver up their nearly borns into the hands of others. And then you have those others, directors, actors, designers, technicians, managers, all the rest of us, including the spectators and hangers arounders who must finish the job, locate the through spirit and deliver the animating jolt that brings the beautiful new baby monster to miraculous life. How does it happen? We know it doesn't happen alone. There is such a thing as authorship as anyone who has faced the blank page knows. But in the human communal art of the theater, there was always a time when writing, like those cut boards, must be joined. Daniel Alexander Jones, the brilliant and humane playwright, director, drag artist, and diva Chandler, taught me that even in solo performance, you're never flying solo. You're always creating from influence and teaching. You're always creating with others, musicians, designers, light board operators, in conversation with others, present and gone. Even alone on stage, the monologuist is in dialogue with the audience. The same is true for a playwright, regardless of how hermetic their studio or gargantuan their talent. While rewriting Perestroika, part two of his Angels in America epic, Tony Kushner added a now famous afterword, acknowledging the contributions of over two dozen collaborators without whom the play would not have been the same or been at all. Even as he defensively, nervously claims that the primary labor on Angels, its authorship was his, Kushner cites Marx's belief that the smallest individual human unit is two, the smallest divisible human unit is two people, not one. One is a fiction. Soaringly, the playwright adds, quote, from such nets of souls, societies, the social world, human life springs and also plays. This is the labor of the new. It's also, I believe, the labor of this life. That is the fulfillment of individual gifts gifts within these nets, the fabric of our society with others. The one who is never just one, however solitary and arduous the task, works, plays, joins with others to form a social order dependent on the best in each. If this is an order for just the few, an order of the familiar, it's not an order at all. It's merely the box we know, a fixed, unchanging thing, that can never hold the immensities of which human beings are capable, that can never expand as the world inevitably expands. A box that has to shore up its walls to keep out the new is sure to break. But the new is a parade stretching back through time. It's a caravan snaking into the future. It's a net of souls from which human life springs and also plays. These life-giving forms can only take shape when our eyes and ears are available to the visions unfamiliar to us and the voices we haven't yet heard. That's why I can't think of playmaking as separate from world-making. They are versions of the same enterprise, the clumsy lumbering labor of dreaming alone and then together, assembling, fashioning, fitting, hammering and scribing, which is also coping and requires coping, joining the most vivid of these dreams into something that gives life and is the best of life because it makes the best of our individual and collective gifts. It's heavy work. And in Kansas City and all around the country, artists and artisans and administrators are having to temporarily lay down their materials, set aside their tools. Work that has taken years to get to the stage has been stopped a horrible loss in a terrifying time, but a loss for the safety of all. I don't wanna minimize this loss and I'm living it for myself and for many of my friends. At the same time, I know that the people who make theater raised on risk, accustomed to crisis and trained in improvisation are also the perfect crew to have around when making a new, healthier, more just and beautiful play world. A healthier, more just and beautiful world and also place. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa and Stuart and Kansas City Rep.
And thank you all for listening and being here wherever you are. Stay safe and sanitized and especially stay sane. We will get through this together because that's what we do. Uh, thank you, Todd London. Um, I'm not sure if anybody can see me yet, but if you can, if I we can were, see you. <laughs> I, can, I can see you. Okay. Um, and if we were in a room full of people, there would be an outrageous applause. Yay. People would be standing <laughs> and cheering. So it's just me. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Thanks for the applause. Thank you. So, thank you so much for those beautiful words. Um, something so necessary at this time. So thank you for filling a little bit of a void on this Saturday morning. Really grateful. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions coming in. Oh, good. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a one person band here in cool. my artist housing. <laughs> so I've, you know, between email and my phone and stuff, I've got a couple yeah. of things coming in. Um, but I wanted to, uh, so, so those of you who have joined or late, I'm here, I'm Lisa Rothy, I'm the director of new works at Kansas City Rep. And we're here with Todd London, uh, who just gave a beautiful keynote speech um, that would have been at the Kansas City uh, New Works Festival. Um, uh, I love how you mind this whole concept of, of work and, and actually this idea of the play carpenter um, it was actually reminding me of Zelda Fitch the Chandler's like artist citizen, as it were. And so as we're moving um, into this and that the, the, the theater demands mm -hmm. social cooperation in an almost unparalleled degree. And um, so a couple of questions that are coming in is um, just kind of starting a little simply. Um, but one of the questions was, what is missing in our landscape? Um, whose voices, what forms, and where are the holes? So that's mm. simple, but also slightly. That's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge question. Um, a, and then, you know what? I, and this is actually three people have um, emailed me already. Mm -hmm. and, and forgive me for those of you who are joining us who don't have access to, to asking questions um, to me because this is all happening so last minute. Um, but if anybody would like to send an email, if you wanted to send to lisa.m.rothy at gmail.com, if you have questions, um, please jump in. We've got about 45 minutes uh, to have this conversation. Um, but one, I'm gonna go back a second. I'm gonna go back actually because it's related to what just happened in this conversation and um, speaking about how technology actually can impact our ability to gather in these uncertain times. So as you said, we are creatures of gathering and also you know, Greek theater was very ritualistic and people were required to attend a shared experience. And one of the things that's coming in about what is lost in translation with screens or is it related to the value of what you're, you were talking about called witnessing and believing, uh, I believe you use witnessing in a political context, can witnessing heal cultural divides, transcend the echo, echo chamber effect. And um, just talking a little bit about at this moment where we are, here we are in a virtual reality, um, uh, how art can stay alive as we're forced to stay apart. Okay, we're starting with a small we're starting question. Starting with a big one. I know. <laughs> yes. We're just going to have a conversation. Well, I, you know, I wish I had some uh, grand wisdom that other people don't have. I mean, I think we're all, you know, we're all swimming in the unknown. And, um, you know, I guess it's hard. Uh, I, I was thinking this morning that, you know, what each of us has been going through, as far as I can tell, I certainly did, were, were related to like the stages of grief, you know, even in thinking about this weekend, our, you know, which is big to us and little in context, you know, oh, I, I, I'm going to get there, we're going to get there, we're going to make it happen, we're going to bargain, we're going to, you know, oh, we'll get there. And then I, there was a time when I was going to like, send you my speech to read because I knew you were there 
And then there was a time when it became really clear it wasn't going to happen and everybody was bummed out. And then there was a chance to go beyond. So I think, you know, there's just so much happening in real time that it's really hard to know. And I appreciate the questions. Um, and I wish I were, uh, I, I were smarter and had more of a crystal ball. What I do think is that, um, you know, just even following Facebook, which has gone from seeming evil to seeming necessary in about 72 hours, um, and reading the beautiful, incredible statements from theater leaders and artists all over the country about why they make the decision to shut down, um, acknowledging and confirming the, the cost to the artists themselves, um, uh, paying tribute to the work that has been done to get these plays and these projects to the stage. Um, it gives me a sense of, you know, I really, really, really believe this. I believe that theater people are among the most beautiful, wonderful, you know, people in the world, partly because of our naive belief that what we do is important and can make change. And I feel like that is on, is on just broad display these last weeks as people um, are sending these messages out and making these really hard decisions. I mean, I saw it in Stuart, you know, I read it yesterday in this beautiful statement from Nataki Garrett at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which is a huge mechanism that has to shut down, affecting hundreds of people's work. Um, everyone who's had a play they've been working on for years and then pushing onto the stage and then it shuts. So all to say, yeah, the cost is really real. And yet there is in theater people, you know, just this incredible um, mother courage marching through the fields ability, um, you know, and that's in a very strange <laughs> capitalistic context. This is in a, a gift economy context that we it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. We right now, you and me, Lisa Rothi and Todd London, we are the Casey Origins New Work Festival. Here we are. Okay. And next year we will all celebrate. You know, mm -hmm. there are, you know, we go through this. This is the world. When, when September 11th happened, we were both in New York and it, it felt like and was for many people the end of the world and the end of something so... Um, unsurvivable, the beginning of something so unsurvivable, but we do survive it. And, um, and I think theater people are more, I'm not answering about technology because I know fuck all about technology, but <clears throat> it's, but here we are, we have these, I mean, think about, you know, I mean, if we lived in plague ridden London in the 1500s, mm -hmm. there were only a hundred thousand of us to begin with. So it was a much smaller community. But at no other time in our history have we had so much information so soon, the ability to connect, what would we be doing if this were even 20 years ago and yeah. this happened? We would know much more slowly about the dangers of the disease and we wouldn't be able to talk to each other at all except on our landlines one at a time. Yeah. So I don't know, that's a non-answer, but the question is, <laughs> so big and it's an improvisation and I hope that yeah. you know in two months we're all sitting around somewhere eating barbecue together uh, me too in my, my house everybody's invited <laughs> everybody who's here now is invited to Brooklyn to Brooklyn sometime in in June question mark um for for barbecue thank you bad barbecue because I've got know. <laughs> well we, we've got we've got a bunch of bottles we can ship them to you awesome. please do <laughs> from Kansas City. shipping is still happening maybe <laughs> yeah um I'm going to just go to I want to go back to just some of your work a little bit um that outrageous fortune right your book examines the lives and livelihoods of American playwrights today and the realities of new play production from the perspective of both playwrights and not-for-profit theaters. Yes. So um, this book came out at the end of 2009. Yeah. So just over 10 years ago, which 
really tried to help us understand why why really new work, work that makes a difference to us all was getting um, it harder and harder to make happen in the mainstream theaters in the US. So I'm just wondering from your perspective about what has changed since then, what have you seen in the field since that time? And are we ready for a sequel? I like these softball questions that you're, <laughs> that you're throwing me. Um, well, a lot has changed. Uh, in, in, strangely, in 10 years. I mean, um, I think the book and um, another project, Gateways of Opportunity, Gates of Opportunity that David Dower was working on for the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation at the time, um, you know, called attention to the financial struggles around new work and about, around the life of playwrights. And I think others, including uh, the Society of Directors and Choreographers, picked up the question for directors and, you know, in my mind, I mean, I was living and often live in the world of playwrights, but um, I think there's a, a bigger picture to the book, which is the lives and livelihoods of independent artists at all. You know, it's that thing, it's like, it's like the Howard Zinn thing, you know, which is like, we hear about history as a history of power and um, success and co corporations and the winners in a way, but what about the history of the people who actually do the labor? You know, not that people working in institutional theaters don't do the labor, they absolutely do, but you know, you make the plays, you direct the plays, you act in the plays, and then you're cut loose. Mm -hmm. So it was in the context of that, and I think, um, I hope that the work that we did through Theater Development Fund on the book with Ben Pesner and Zani Voss um, and Tori Bailey leading us um, helped to call attention to some of those issues. I think around new work, you know, um, there's been and there was leading up to that a lot of attention called to like, how do we continue the life of new work? How do we get beyond just what was often called premier itis? How do we circulate work as the National New Play Network does with their rolling world premieres and their expanded network of theaters? So that kind of thing. But then there's a lot of other stuff that has changed that's so interesting to me. Um, so one thing is um, for playwrights, television has changed. It's gone from sure. being a kind of dirty little secret that you know people turn to at a certain point of the, their flailing career because all careers flail at times and it's gone to like an end in itself a wonderful end that um, allows people to not only exercise uh, creativity and their skills but also to take true leadership I mean we have playwrights leading you know multi-million dollar budgeted shows and uh, really having a kind of power that they're rarely granted in the theater, which won't even hire them for artistic director positions. Um, that's been a change and that will have, you know, huge impact on the theater if it hasn't already. Um, it, it has. We, we also, something that I'm fascinated by is two things that kind of have moved simultaneously since then, which is um, artists taking initiative to assess the field and map the field, especially in terms of its uh, equity and diversity and inclusiveness to artists of all uh, stripes. So we have not only the count, which was started at the with the, the by the Lilly Awards by um, Julia Jordan and Marsha Norman, um, but we also have all kinds of counts. The Asian American Performing Arts Coalition, a League um, of Professional Theater Women, a League of Professional Theater Women, um, you know, individuals like Portia McGovern looking at women right. designers and directors in Lord theaters. So there, and, and then out of that, or you know, simultaneous things like the Kilroy's List and uh -huh. ways of getting work that has been previously less known or less seen into the field, and also holding the, a mirror up to the to our field to say, this is what we are, this is how we present ourselves, even though we sometimes think we're, often think we're doing the best with the best intentions, what are we actually doing? So those are, are um, real changes. And then of course, I mean, the most um, significant one that I've been thinking about in the past really just year or two is this incredible and moving 
and hopeful generational change of leadership around the country at the institutional theaters. Um, more and more women leaders, um, which is interesting because it's a field that was founded by women, like you mentioned, Zelda Fitchhandler, and then was turned over. Patricia McGrath, actually, too, from Kansas City. And Patricia McGrath. Mc McElrath, is McElrath. McElrath at uh, Kansas City Rep, you know, and Nina Vance and Margaret Jones. It is, a, it is a field that was founded by women. And then once it became mature, men were brought in to take over. <laughs> and then now more and more women and people of color are moving into positions of leadership. Younger artists are moving into positions of leadership. And that's amazing. And I, you know, and I'm cheering from here and I, and I can't wait to see what happens and what this means, especially Me because I think the new leaders have a really different sense of like how new work sits, what it means to have a community that isn't just subscribers and patrons, but is actually neighbors and people that you want to welcome into your theater. So, so many changes. I'm, you know, talking really fast to get some of them in. <laughs> well, you, you kind of were then answering all the questions I was asking before and what's missing in our landscape, whose voices, what forms some of yeah. that as well. So thank you. I have a, I have a question from Lori Walter Hudson. Okay. From Indiana. Hi, Lori. Hi. From Indiana. Um, Hi. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about your experience getting to know a writer's work and canon over seven years at New Dramatist. Um, seven? That was 17 years. Seven years. Seven Se years. Oh, sorry. Seven years. Okay. No, I was 17. Things? I was 18. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there something in the idea of audiences getting to know a writer over various seasons oh. that could build audience empathy? Oh. Uh, she says, I think about James Still's 20 plus year legacy. Love James Still. Shout out. Yeah. Um, as a playwright in residence at Indiana Repertory Theater yeah. and how he's become a local celebrity. His shoes have become a highlight of every season for subscribers. Signature Theater in New York City has that same goal, get to know a writer and know them better through their body yeah. of work. What do you think about the idea of launching a program that centers a playwright in residence at every regional theater in the country? How long does it take to pull audiences in? And is that idea limiting or liberating? Yeah. Oh, what a great question, Laurie. Thank you so much. Um, I think many things about that. First of all, one of the other changes that came about after Outrageous Fortune and David Dower's work was the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, launched its National Playwright Residency Program, which actually, uh, and actually Kansas City Rep was with uh, Nathan Jackson, was one of the um, oh, right. early uh, recipients of that, which was a three-year salaried residency for playwrights. And part of that was to provide stable lives for playwrights and also to integrate them into the lives of the theaters and also to integrate them into the local audiences in the way that Laurie is asking. Mm -hmm. um, it, that program is about to announce its third or I want to say maybe fourth, third round, I think it might be fourth, mm -hmm. but I think it's the third round of residencies. Some have repeated. So there are uh, playwrights like Pearl Clegg in um, Atlanta, who was spent six years in residency there. I think Will Power may have spent six years in residency at Dallas Theater Center. Um, so I think it's a great and wonderful idea. I think that the research that Theater uh, Development Fund and Theater Bay Area were doing around um, uh, triple play was an attempt to get theaters, uh, uh, theater administrators and artistic directors in a way out of the position of mediating between playwrights and audiences mm -hmm. so that they could speak directly to each other and get to know each other. Um, I think, you know, it goes back, um, so history nerd about to speak, um, it goes back to the roots of a big impulse in the founding of the regional and resident theaters, which precedes them in a way, goes back to about the 20s in places like South Dakota and North Carolina, which is the notion of regional playwrights, regional voices um, that come out of a community and then and thus speak to the community. And I think you 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 cannot, we cannot underestimate the power of that or the necessity for that. I don't know when it happened that we came to think of the theater as a mass media, mm -hmm. um, you know, for a mainstream audience. The theater has always been local. Mm 
So the idea that we have local theaters that sprung up in the 50s and 60s and later in the 70s that would all call from the 75% of playwrights who live on either coast, especially in New York and LA, and they would be able to speak to all those same audiences. I don't know where that idea came from. Mm -hmm. um, I moved about four years ago, my family, uh, or six years ago, we moved to Seattle from New York and then moved back four years later. Mm -hmm. And in that move, I saw, I just woke up to the fact that New York and Seattle they're not the same place. Mm -mm. And because we drove there and drove back, all those places in between are not New York and Seattle. Mm -hmm. And so why wouldn't, so I think it's a beautiful idea that there are playwrights who live and work over time in these areas and audiences really get to know them. And, and what that does, and then I will stop this answer, <laughs> is it, so something happened in the, in the um, institutional theater, and I really learned this from Tori Bailey at Theater Development Fund. Um, there was a moment where we stopped talking about audience development and we turned all of that work of audience development over to marketing departments. As if by just selling plays or selling productions or selling the theater well, we would develop that audience. But audience development is a conversation that happens over time. We sit around in our artist echo chamber and we talk about things that are maybe years before our audiences will see them or understand them or know them or get enough access to them. And so that signature model or that profile theater model in Portland or that um, the Indiana rep model or that the residency model of it just, it just, does the work we were meant to do, which is to speak to the people of our communities in um, an ongoing way. Mm -hmm. And it takes it out of the hands of, it's not that marketing departments are, are bad at that work. They do it the best their, of their ability, but it's not their sure. job. It's not sure. their job. I wanna go back to what you were talking about, actually the founding of all of this, right? And the conversations that were happening in the regions. And, yeah. um, you know, here we are in, we're in Kansas City and that that conversation too, I had this conversation a lot with my, one of my teachers and mentors, Zelda Luca Chandler, who I mentioned earlier uh, when I was an MFA student at NYU. And she was, as you say, I believe you, um, what was the, you said this anyway, the great founding rabbi of the regional, of the regional theater. And she was able to achieve so much due to her unsurpassed skills of persuasion and using what you called her dazzling Talmudic mind. So I know you spent some time with Zelda and many boxes of yeah. her writings and speeches. I just wanna talk, just hear a little bit about that project, some of the takeaways of the time that you spent with Zelda and with her writings and when we can expect to see what you've compiled in print. Oh. Well, okay. Is that a bad question? No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's just a, you know, there's just, there is so much to mourn at this moment. And, um, mm -hmm. and I mourn the loss of Zelda Fitchhandler and uh, I mourn her, the loss of her in our lives and that sort of thing. So um, sometime before I moved to Seattle in 2014, I, um, Zelda reached out to me as someone who, you know, has written about the, the movement that she helped found. And I was one of a long line of helpers um, in her, her many, many year uh, attempt to create a book, a collection of her years of writing, um, essays, speeches, sometimes grant proposals that were in effect extended essays. Um, and ways of articulating the underlying principles and changing dynamics of the movement that she helped found and led for 40 years at ARENA, 25 years as the head of graduate acting at NYU, um, a little time as the head of the acting, artistic director of the acting company in there. And Zelda had this amazing ability that I think of as an ability to um, uh, fix 
the bicycle and theorize about the bicycle while riding the bicycle downhill. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like she just had this incredible mind and was a very active leader and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, I worked with her for on and off for a few years. She actually encouraged me to take the job that I took in Seattle and we would talk on the phone. We, she would send, you know, literally, literally, I think there's like 18 boxes of her work gathered by her longtime assistant, Angie Moy. And um, at a certain point, and it was a huge moment in my life, she called me in Seattle and she said, I'm, I might be going into surgery. I'm not sure I will be able to continue the work on the book. Would you make sure that it gets done? And I can't do it. She didn't go into surgery. She lived for another year and a half or so. I think she died at 93 or 94 mm -hmm. years old. And, um, but after that, she didn't work on the book anymore. So when she died a few years ago, I um, took over finishing the book for TCG, Theater Communications Group, um, which was an editing project, but it was also really, um, it's a really life-giving thing, as you know, from, you know, she was such an important person in your life. Mm -hmm. um, she was a more distant, important person in my life, but for a long, long time. And you become really intimate with somebody when you yeah. live in their words, their hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words. And so that work um, is going to is due out in the fall from TCG. Um, it's been I've delivered it, we're going to start editing any day and never know when that day is. And, um, and it's a great read for people. And I say it not because it's mine, it's hers. It's a great read uh, for reminder about why we're in it what the human work of the theater is. Um, it's just, it's really the most soul nourishing kind of editorial work I've ever engaged in. I can't wait to read it. I mean, I uh, just a sliver of it, you know, we would start the beginning of the new year every semester. The, in the grad yeah. acting program. In the grad acting program. And she would have these incredibly eloquent and <laughs> deep, <laughs> <laughs> meaningful speeches yeah. and you know Zelda was a complex figure mm -hmm. in many ways and wonderful and um but those speeches were always so incredibly inspiring to like yeah. kick off the new year you know yeah. especially your second year when you're a mess and everything's falling yeah. apart so that was great. yeah so thank you for that I look forward to sure. to hearing that um uh Liz Engelman okay has reached out <laughs> hey Liz <laughs> she said she mentioned the wonderful ritual that we went through um, it was a it was a conversation around a table yesterday at our uh, at our artistic meeting. We were just before we knew that we were canceling actually the productions, and but we knew that the festival was going to be canceled. And I just started imagining what that would have been like, um, and what the weekend, how beautiful and great the weekend was, and how wonderful the people were. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, she says, "What are you imagining now as the highlights to be as we still try to make theater in this unimaginable time?" What might it look like looking back? All of your friends are coming in with us. Oh, so Liz Engelman is um, one of the great dramaturgical minds in our country and one of the great spirits in our theater. Um, so of course, she's gonna pose a question about looking ahead <laughs> and imagining the future. Um, yeah. I really wish I wasn't having to field some of these questions about the future and what this uh, is going to bring about. But, um, you know, we I, can We can span this out too. We can have like a series of fireside chats. That oh, that'd be great. Uh, you don't have to answer it all now. Yes, with a dwindling <laughs> audience, I'm sure it'd be great. Um, you know, I, I, so I've been teaching, I've been teaching at the new school and like, uh, faculty, theater faculty, I mean, all faculty across the country were dealing with the closings of schools. And um, it's particularly impactful in fields like the theater that um, demand us being live together. And I'm especially feeling it 
for the students, who, the graduating students and the yeah. culminating MFA students who have their final productions or their first production, full productions or their um, public readings or their performances or their showcases or whatever, whatever. And, um, but one of the things that I've noticed in the few days that we've been trying to problem solve some of the months ahead with our students is that once they, like us, like the rest of us, once they get over the initial, or once they get kind of through the initial disappointments and angers and um, historic kind of the frustration, the fuming at the world that is out of our control, once they kind of um, let go of all that's unmanageable, um, they are so freaking brilliant at thinking of other ways to do their work, yeah. you know? So um, one of the things that it, maybe this is an answer to, to Liz's question that I imagine is that we will um, expand the depth of our global intimacy by getting used to connecting in different ways. Um, which has been something that's been saved for sort of the conference room, you know, um, that we will um, find out of necessity in the way that multimedia maybe artists have been finding out of their personal necessity ways to um, expand what we think of as live and what we think of as gathering. Um, and I'm resistant to it. I mean, my, I have a, my brother who was a management consultant years ago, he was working remotely. He had a team that was like all over the globe who he had never met, who he worked with for years, but he had mm -hmm. never met live. And years ago, he said to me something like, well, the theater should really learn to use these tools because you're gonna right. use them. And I was like, fuck you. The theater is about being together live in space. I'm not, I'm not gonna use these tools. But now out of necessity, those of us who haven't, may have to, may have to think um, about space. You know, it's not just the old Peter right. Brooks empty space with one person watching and one person performing. Space is something really different. What does it mean to be in between space? What does it mean to acknowledge? Uh, and I'm a retreat person and I know Liz Engelman who asked that she runs Tofty Late Retreat Center. So we want to be alone in retreat with other artists. You know what I mean? In we want to be alive in nature and in buildings with people, mm -hmm. people next to us, sweaty people. And, um, but you know, maybe that like, I, this is great talking to you like this. I mean, when do we get to do this yeah hardly um, ever with and yeah. we have our you can have your coffee i have my coffee can have I a have, candle you have your artist <laughs> pillows <laughs> up against the couch up against the couch yeah yeah so it opens up yeah. things because necessity does and then because we are an artistic community we find ways to use what we've learned mm -hmm. and i think it's part of i don't mean to sound all buddhist about it but it's it is a way of accepting what is mm -hmm. and part of what is is that we're cut off from each other in physical proximity and part of what is is that we live in a world that has tools that we may have been or i speak for myself reluctant to turn to yeah. in an artistic context right and you know and of course there have been artists who've been acknowledging that what is for a long long time who have been so far ahead of us and now we're like going on their websites to find advice about how to teach remotely you know or how to create remotely um, but you know, the world keeps changing and, it does. and there we are. Yeah, I think I mentioned to you, my, my wife is a literature professor and is a modernist and postmodernist and was just like, oh gosh, and is teaching online now. And, and at first there was no one on the screen and then all of the you know, students started showing up one by one and as opposed to a distancing mechanism, which I think she thought that was gonna be, yeah. but actually there was an intimacy, which I think we're all craving yeah. right now. Very much. Um, I'm glad you told that story because I re I refrained from telling it <laughs> because it's yours to tell, but it's so wonderful. Yeah. I know. So shout out. Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Morgan Janess reaches out and says she doesn't have a question, but she has much gratitude. Thank you for this. 
and for your usually incredibly, your usual incredibly well articulated and insightful truth and inspiration. Exactly what was needed at this pivot point. So thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Morgan Shanas. Morgan yeah. Shanas, another one of our leading, brilliant, big hearted, dramaturgical guides through this crazy life. Um, I love you, Morgan, and thank you for that. And thank you for being with us. Um, Laura Eason, who would have hey, been at the festival. Yes. yes. Hi, Laura. <laughs> Thanks for your play, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she wrote just to say that uh, your beautiful thoughts have felt like a balm this morning. Mm. And she's grateful to you and for all you've given to our field and also to all of us at Casey Origin to make it possible to still have this experience this morning. Oh, so thank God. you to you all for joining in. Yeah. Um, it's so funny having this conversation, having no idea actually. <laughs> Who, if like, anyone is listening, but I'm, our glad, I'm glad that glad that Laura is there. And, okay. and I have to give a shout out to my wife, Karen Hartman, because she read an earlier version of this address and she, and as of yesterday, she was like, you know, it's really incumbent on you to spend more time talking about the plays since people aren't going to be able to see them. And I, you know, and I, of course I would want to, but I thought it was ridiculous to do it in the context of a live speech because I didn't want to give stuff away. Sure. So, and everyone uh, will have seen them. Yeah, the projections totally. and the readings. Yeah, exactly. So, so Laura and Stacy and Dean and Kyle, thank you for your plays. Um, Laura said, contributing to the how do we stay together during our separation question, she would pitch, uh, can we use this time of isolation to prepare for when we're together again? Yeah. Can we take this time of forced stillness to rest a little more? Us theater people who go, go, go to just get a little sleep for once. And us playwrights <laughs> finally, finally, exclamation, finish our, our outstanding commissions. Yeah. Can we write or at least start that passion project we've long thought about but have never had time to work on? Can we read the work of others we want to get to know better, but again, never seem to find the time? Yeah. yeah. Huge. It's huge. And uh, so those are some of the things she's thinking about, uh, about how to use this time yeah. during these unprecedented times. I love that list and I love the question. I, you know, I, we, we encountered it with our students too. It's, you know, we now will by forced measure have time that we always say we don't have for all of these sorts of things. And so what are the things on everybody's lists? Um, uh, it's, yeah, how best to use the time. And, um, <clears throat> and then the other piece of it is I keep, you know, there's a, a piece of advice that the amazing playwright and actor uh, Ellen McLaughlin gave me years ago when I was going through a personal crisis, um, which was simply, she said, feel everything. And I think about that all the time and I think about it now. I mean, you know, right now we are living in real time through this thing, but for those of us who write or create in any measure or just as humans, I know that we are this, we're going to look back on this. There will be a time when we look back, whatever that time looks like, and we will use it. This will become, you know, I was telling my students about, you know, go read Red Noses by Peter Barnes, go read AIDS plays, go, you know, look at Waiting for Godot, which is a different version of the vast in between, Laura's vast in between. What does it mean to be waiting for something that never comes? Um, we will use this time, so feel everything and use the time and then know that you will be using, we will be using it later because it's part of our shared history. Yeah, it's funny you bring up red noses because I, I, who was I, somebody, whoever it was that I was talking to recently, please send me an email. I, I was just having this conversation because we did red noses in grad school. And then after that, I saw this beautiful production of Red Noses at Juilliard that Christopher Bayes directed. And I was like, we were like, this is the time to do that. And we should do a remote and virtual online totally. version of this yeah. play at the moment. And, you know. Yeah, that's I, a great I, idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is. It's like, um, so uh, some years ago, I don't remember who it was, was setting up readings of It Can't Happen Here, the Sinclair Lewis oh, yeah. um, novel that became a play for the WPA in the end, lead up to... Uh, this 2016 election, um, Abigail Katz from the Atlantic Theaters um, 
company and myself, we, we set up a series of what we called Constitution Out Loud right after the election, which was asking people wherever they were to sit together and read the Constitution out loud and then discuss it and their little pocket constitutions. And a lot of people did it and we did it in different places. And I think there's lots of this is a time we could, that there's no reason those kinds of things can't happen. Mm -hmm. the, red, the Red Noses initiative can't happen or the AIDS plays initiative. Boy, when that was going on, it seemed like it would never end. And, the, and, the, and in some ways it doesn't, but the, in other ways, you know, only the morning continues and, the, um, and life goes on. So, you know, uh, yeah, great idea. Thank you. Um, I, we have about six minutes left. Okay. I think we might get kicked off of this platform. I'm not quite sure how that works or are they gonna just let us speak indefinitely? I don't know, <laughs> but you probably need to refill your coffee. No. But a few, a few questions. One is from David Diamond. Hi, David. Oh, David, he says he finds that resilience can be a challenge for artists in the best of times. Now it seems that more of us individually and as a community will need to be resilient. Do you have any thoughts how we can bolster our access to what is required of us so we can help our communities? Well, thank you, David, for that. And I have to shout out to David because he has served at, at um, some important times in my life as an executive coach, or maybe not executive, just like a personal coach. Um, and um, I think a couple of things, and I've seen some of these, you know, suggested online. I loved a Facebook post from Aaron Washington, who's a great spirit of the theater teaching down at Spelman College. It's like, take care of yourself, you know, drink your turmeric tea and, <laughs> you know, um, get exercise and sleep and resilience comes from a, um, a vitalized uh, spirit and body. Yeah. Um, so partly there's that. Um, I believe, so this is, this is maybe a bit of a Pollyanna answer and David will write me later and say, how could you be so naive? Um, not that he would, um, but I believe we've been practicing for this moment. Certainly those of you, those of us who sh share my political concerns about the um, corrosive political moment and the, the, uh, the truly dangerous presidency, um, <clears throat> I think we've been building resistance. I think, you know, I felt and I saw around me after the 2016 election, a great deal of despondency and fear. And I think even though there's always the danger of normalcy that there's been a, mus a, a kind of working the muscles of resiliency. And even the fact that that word has become, you know, from she persisted to resilience to resistance, you know, all of these kinds of turns on that um, idea have really come into the foreground of our thinking. Um, I think just got to, I mean, I don't know what to say, David, except people just have to keep working. People have to get back to their desks and not give in to the kind of nightmare version of this, which is that we all walk around like George Romero zombies in you know, a stupor because we can't shop anymore. Um, but just that, again, it's that thing that Laura mentioned, taking the time to do the work that we've been putting off, yeah. getting back to our desk, reaching out to our friends. I realized yesterday that I have some friends who are, um, older and possibly immune compromised that I, as soon as this is over today, I need to give a call to and reach out to. Um, we build resilience through, by building connection with each other um, and by keeping our strength up individually. You know, I, I was thinking that this conversation to, because of today, because so much has happened in the last 72 hours, that this conversation would have been very different uh -huh. And so, you know, what people are asking, and I think what the need is right now, this need to connect and to try to figure out how to move on. Stacey Rose just wrote to say, hello, thank you for all of this. It's helpful, healing, and inspiring of, uh, for her to think of the ways she can keep going. That's great. So this I was, is all very useful. I met Stacey very briefly when she was um, helping produce a tribute to Lynn Nottage for the... Um, uh, for Independence Kansas for the Inge Center, which oh, yeah. is going to honor Lynn next, in May, I think. Um, and I was so looking forward to really meeting her at the 
festival, but I was so happy to read Legacy Land. What a beautiful, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful play and really beautiful production. So that we're going to see that. You're open that. It she's in all. Kansas City with you. She, yeah, she's she's here. She's in oh, Kansas good. City. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a what they were calling last night an opening. An opening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll I have a small I, group of people. We can't just we can't say break legs too much physical. Mm -hmm. We have to just say married. Married yes. for tonight. Married. <laughs> I think we've got like a minute left and, you know, I, I just want to say, let's see, um, a couple of people have also <laughs> said hello. Uh, uh, oh my goodness. There's just a bunch of things coming on. Lisa Peterson says hello hey, and Lisa. thank you. Um, and also we're just leaving off, but I wanted to leave off with just a couple things. Um, one is you've got this novel coming out. I think we should have another conversation sometime and talk about that. It's out. <laughs> It's, it's out. out. It's available Amazing. everywhere uh, that you can order online, as long as they're still delivering. Right. So I'm going to get that. Everybody, you can buy that book. You can buy it's all called, the Todd's If books. you see them, let me know. If you see him, let me know. I don't even know the name of my own novel. Jesus, I only worked on it for 18 <laughs> years. Where are we? I think we need <laughs> more coffee. Um, I want to just say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining in. Thank you to all of the staff and artists, the leadership of Kansas City Repertory Theater, to our local community and to the theater community at large, to all of you. Um, one thing I want to say is if it's just possible, because I know this has been running on Facebook and um, various uh, online uh, platforms, is just to say if it's at all possible on behalf of all theaters closing their doors for the time being, if you've bought a ticket for a show and you're not able to use it due to a show being canceled, and if you're in a financial position to do so, please consider converting your purchase into a donation into the totally. organization. Yeah. You know, with so many unknowns about the lasting effect of this pandemic, these sorts of efforts will be incredibly useful for supporting artists now and in the future. So I just wanted to just say that yeah. for everybody. You know, I'm, we're, I'm sure we're speaking to the converted here. Can I, add, can I add one thing, Please, Lisa? Yes, of course. If you are in a position um, to need work being done, uh, anything, you know, that is, you know, any kind of artistic help, any kind of hire an artist. People are out of work now, people who are part of the freelance community. Um, that's another way to support people too. Great. Any, any final words that you'd like to share? No, I just want to really thank you. I want to thank you guys for punting so effectively. Uh, <laughs> this has been really great. It's horrifying to be, you know, sitting here speaking to, you, you know, I wish I had known that some of you were here with us uh, beforehand, but we couldn't know. And um, just to wish everybody, uh, you know, an easy way through a really tough time. And, um, to keep in touch and thank you, Lisa, for making this beautiful um, festival. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> the, the, in no our mind. the No Festival Festival. The no festival. Happened, yeah. And I will see you in Kansas City another time for barbecue. And again, everybody's invited to Karen's and my place. We're holding the, you to it. In the future. Yeah. So we're sending our, our, our theater artists, friends, all of our love and support and solidarity as we take care of ourselves and each other in this uncertain moment. So I hope, I hope we get a chance to do this again. This was yeah. great. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay.